So we have a relationship between force and momentum. That force is the time rate of change, of momentum, and that just came from Newton's second law. And if I turn this around, it means that a small change in momentum is given by the force, I should say net force, multiplied by how much time has gone by. And this means in turn that a total change in momentum is found by adding up all of those small changes. Which means integrating from the initial time to the final time the net force dt, which means if I have a graph of force versus time, the impulse, that's delta p, is given by the area under the curve. So delta p, or impulse, delta p equals area bounded by f of t on whatever time interval you're looking at. So in some problems, you may be actually given a time variable force that's some complicated function, and you have to use calculus to do this. But there are a lot of problems where you can just find the area under the curve graphically, and that's what I want to illustrate here. So let's get an example in. And things are a bit crowded, but I got my example in here. And I have the force with an unusual scale on it. I'm supposed to take these vertical values and multiply them by 100. So these are hundreds of newtons. And then I have time in seconds. And my force begins at zero and steadily increases for two seconds to a maximum of 400 newtons, after which it levels off. This is applied to a mass of 60 kilograms that starts from rest, which should simplify things for us. And I'm asked a couple questions. First, get the speed of the object at t equals 5 seconds. So now that I know impulse is given by the area bounded by f of t, I can say that delta p, that's p final minus p initial. p initial, by the way, is 0 because the object started from rest. And that'll be given by the area under the curve. And so if I know the final momentum and I know the mass, I can get the final velocity and thus the final speed. So let's get the area under the curve. We can just um, look at this rectangle and this triangle and use geometry to get the area. There's no need for calculus here. So this is 3 times 4. That's 12. And then this one is 1 half times 2 times 4, which is an additional 4. So we have 16 squares. But each square is 100 newtons high and one second wide. So my area is going to be 1,600 newtons times seconds. Um, I should explore the units on that real quick. A, a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So this gives me units of kilogram meters per second, which are units of momentum. So that's encouraging. And that's going to be equal to P final, which is the mass of the object, 60 kilograms, times the final velocity. So I end up with a final velocity of 1,600 divided by 60, or 26.7 meters per second, pointing to the right. Question B is primarily a concept question. Uh, it's really a trick to see if you'll take the area under this curve and say that it's equal to the work. But that was only true for a force versus position graph, and this is a force versus time graph. So how are we going to get at the total work? It's not the area under the curve. But I know the object started from rest, so the kinetic energy was zero in the initial state. And then the object ended up moving this fast, so I can just find the change in kinetic energy and say that must be the total work on the object. So I'm really using the work energy theorem if you want to be formal about it. I take the final kinetic energy minus the initial. It tells me how much energy was pumped into the, the object. In other words, how much work was done. So my total work is going to be 
one half m v final squared and I'll calculate that real quick and I come out with to three sig figs 21,400 joules total work <laughs> 